Now for our next speakers, a husband and wife duo who are both innovative entrepreneurs building their own community-based businesses. Um, Neil Blumenthal is the co-founder and co-chief executive of the pioneering eyewear company Warby Parker, a brand created to cut out the middleman and sell high-quality, beautifully designed eyewear online at a reasonable price. Warby Parker has more than 50 retail locations across the US and Canada and has grown to over 1,000 employees. His wife and partner, Rachel Blumenthal, is no less accomplished and for a time worked, al worked alongside Neil at Warby Parker. But now she is the founder and chief executive of Rockets of Awesome, which, pro which offers parents a simpler and smarter way to shop for high quality clothing. Her pioneer, pioneering and dynamic retail concept combines data from customer behavioral patterns with their children's preferences to provide a curated delivery of outfits each season. Earlier this year, I met with Rachel and Neil and learned about the fascinating role that data and algorithms have been, have been playing in shaping their businesses. And interestingly, last night in the Salon on Embedding Innovation, there was Quite a there was quite a tension between one group of people who saw the power of data and technology and one group of people who saw the focus on design. And what you'll find is that these two brands have found a really interesting way of balancing the two. To learn more, I'm delighted to welcome our New York editor, Lauren Sherman, to interview Rachel and Neil on The Voices stage. Hi, everybody. Hi guys, thanks for being here. Do you use the same producer for your videos? <laughs> no. <laughs> we haven't seen those cute. videos in a long time. <laughs> so, so I have a question for you, Rachel. In, in your video, there are very cute photos of unicorns and, and there's that whole s slogan about algorithm and unicorns. Can you talk about what that means for Rockets of Awesome? Because I know that this group is very familiar with Warby Parker because they mention Warby Parker to me quite often, but maybe they're <laughs> not as familiar with Rockets of Awesome. Sure. Um, so Rockets of Awesome is a personal shopping service and vertical apparel brand for kids. And our sole mission in life is to deliver solutions and services for parents. And so our customers onboard onto our site, they create a profile, they tell us everything their kids like or don't like down to every nitpicky preference. And with that information, and our algorithms enable us to deliver completely personalized assortments to our customers. Um, but what we're very sensitive to is the fact that unlike some personal shopping services in men's or women's wear, parents don't want a stylist for their kids. That feels very frivolous. And so we really focus on how do we make your life easier and making sure that parents feel savvy. Um, and we are also very sensitive to the fact that parents don't necessarily want to share information about their children. They're private about that information. And so um, we think a lot about how do we talk about the data? How do we talk about the algorithms? And how do we make it right for Rockets of Awesome? And Rockets of Awesome is a very over-the-top, celebratory, really fun brand. And so for us, we talk a lot about algorithms and unicorns in a way to make it more digestible. So unicorns are the little bit of magic totally. that's included. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like the fashion industry really wants to know how to use data. They have all this data. I, I feel like I could see a ream of, of um, sales information coming through. But they don't know what to do with it for future. Neil, you talk to a lot of fashion brands about this. You, you operate a fashion brand. How do you think fashion in general could better use data to inform their future decisions? Uh, well, first I have to thank you because I feel like we're living out our dream as Justin and Brittany have right now. Have you guys ever done this before? <laughs> no, this is our first. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, it, it's funny when um, um, we live in a bunch of different worlds, the tech startup world, the fashion design world, and the social enterprise world. When I'm in the social enterprise world or, or uh, the, the tech world, right, the use of data is, is a given. Um, but then when I'm speaking to colleagues uh, within the fashion world, you know, it's, there uh, is this 
tension uh, that is perceived between the use of data um, and creating emotional responses. Um, and, and I think that that's misplaced. I mean, the best thing about the fashion industry is that we create emotional uh, experiences and, and responses, but we can use data to enhance those, um, even if it's as simple um, as you know, us being a, a vertically integrated brand, uh, we're able to obviously see return rates. Um, in our stores, we have this thing called a reference desk, um, which is how we service our customers that may need adjustments, for example. Um, the reference desk uh, pays homage to a reference desk in a library because everything with the brand has a literary heritage because the, the name comes from two early Jack Kerouac characters. Um, but there, we're able to track, okay, this particular frame had a minor adjustment. Um, is this skew um, having a disproportionate number of adjustments relative to our other products? If so, um, is that a design flaw? Is that a, a production flaw? Is that something wrong with our merchandising where we're trying to you know, sell the frame to the wrong person, for example. Um, so uh, we're able to use that data day in and day out, and different people within the team have access to it. Um, I'd share sort of another example of um, you know, where we try and combine qualitative and quantitative data where uh, we had this observation where people are walking into some of our stores with crumpled up pieces of paper with the frame names written on it because clearly they had gone to the website and they were, trying, they were browsing all these different frames. And we thought, wow, that's a really crappy experience. Uh, what if we just created some simple favoriting uh, functionality on the site? Then they could have a digital list. Uh, but then also, how do we make that digital list available to our retail associates so they can easily just pull it up on, on their iPads? Um, and then the next step uh, will be having those frames ready for people when they walk in the door. Uh, but the point is, is that we can use just uh, this data and observations to figure out um, how do we continually enhance the experience. Rachel, how do you use data in the design process and when does it not work or does it not matter? Yeah, so uh, we are a business that launched about a year ago, so we're very new um, in the life cycle of our business. And as you can imagine, the supply chain, even in a startup and innovative business, is still um, rather slow. And so we actually had to design into our first three seasons with no data. Um, and for that, just like any other vertical brand, traditionally, we leveraged the expertise of merchants and designers. Um, but as we've collected data and have very robust data sets, and and we're able to understand what those data sets look like against our customers and the anticipated customers that will come in that will acquire, um, we're able to leverage that information to identify best-selling fabrics, best silhouettes, graphics, and so forth. And we use that to not only create our merchandising plan, but to determine what we design into and, more interestingly, what we buy into. And so um, because we have a reoccurring business where our customers are delivering an assortment every season, so we know that your kids are going to come back and we're going to send you a box in, in three to four months, um, we're actually able to predict what items, based on what items you've purchased in the past, what we anticipate you're going to purchase over the next several months, what we're going to then send you, and what you're going to purchase in an upcoming uh, shipment to determine what we buy into. So we're actually doing that at the specific customer level versus more broadly at, oh, girls who are four who like pink, for instance. So how do you get your customer to tell you stuff? Of course, there's the information that you know giving up a credit card number is, is going to get you, but how do you get them to open up more? feel like both of you need that in different ways, so. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's about the relationship with the customer and uh, building a mission-driven business that is very authentic to that customer and what they need and building that trust and the loyalty. And for us, that really stems from brand. And so being very clear and having a defined point of view on who we are and being very authentic to that. and. You know, our team is a team full of parents, and so we're building a business for our team, and we really understand what parents want and what they're looking for and their sensitivities around that data and making sure that um, as we build the brand and the experiences, we're building that trust with the customer. And so what we find is fascinating is that not only are customers not afraid to share information like they might be with Amazon, for instance, um, but they're actually extremely forthcoming, and they're sharing 
Facebook pages so that we can see the photos of their kids so that we can get the assortment even more precise. And as we build a relationship with them, they're understanding that the more information they share with us, the better their experience. And so they continue to want to share more and more. And frankly, they also want to be heard. They want somebody to understand sort of the frustrations of dressing kids and their kids fighting with them. And they want that reciprocation on the other side. If I could build on that, um, customers will share information if you're going to use it to make their lives better. Um, if you were to ask any retailer, um, what is the number one zip code uh, that they have in their database? It's often 90210. Um, and that's not because people live in that zip code. It's because the retailers are asking people post-purchase, uh, what's your zip code so they can better market to them, right? Like, no, and so people just give a fake zip code of what, what comes to mind. Um, so if, if you're able to make someone's life better and explain sort of how and why you're going to use the data, people will share it. And that requires a bit of vulnerability on your end, right? That means the brand needs to open up in a certain way. Uh, absolutely. You know, we're deep believers that brands can build relationships um, with their customers the same way that human beings build relationships with each other, and that's through vulnerability. So I think back to when we launched, uh, we were featured in Vogue and GQ. The company took off like a rocket ship. We hit our first year sales targets in three weeks, sold out of our top 15 styles in four weeks, had a wait list of over 20,000 people, um, and uh, we were up all night responding to customers and had to apologize. Um, and they accepted that apology because we would explain to them, hey, we just launched this company. The, the response has been overwhelming. We, we didn't expect it. Um, so explaining the how and the why and making ourselves vulnerable um, uh, helped us sort of build advocates very early. Um, and then what the funny things started to happen. So when we launched, uh, we have this home try-on program where you have, uh, we send you five pairs of frames. You have five days to try it on at home uh, before deciding that you want to purchase. At that point, we'll put in prescription lenses and send it to you. Um, we had to temporarily suspend our home try-on program uh, because we ran out of inventory. Um, people started to call up and say, oh, hey, um, you know, can we come into your office to try on glasses? Because I noticed that you know, your home try-on program is temporarily suspended. Um, and at the time, we were working out of our apartment. And we were like, uh, um, you know what? You can come to our apartment. Um, and what we did was we only invited five people to start, because we figured like if we destroyed our uh, reputation with five people, it wouldn't be catastrophic. Um, but they walked in. Um, th we put the glasses on the dining room table. We had a nice antique mirror that people could use. Um, and they would see a bunch of people working on our couch, <laughs> sort of slaving away. Um, and and uh, again, that was a form of vulnerability and people peeking behind the curtain. And it was something different that these people ended up being some of our biggest advocates, just getting, telling the world about us. And that could have gotten a little weird. So. Uh, absolutely. So we, um, we, we live in New York, but um, at the time I was in graduate school in Philadelphia, um, and I think that Philly had like the second highest murder rate in, uh, in the U.S. at the time. <laughs> So, Rachel, you had another company before this called Cricket Circle, and the community there kind of helped create Rockets of Awesome, right? Can you talk a little bit? Emily was talking about this with Into the Gloss and Glossier. Talk a little bit about how that happened. Yeah, so not dissimilar than Into the Glass and Glossier, um, completely different demographic was that uh, Cricket Circle was basically a cliff notes for what to buy when you have a baby. And what we recognized was that there were no businesses speaking to this generation of new moms. And they were really forgotten. It was as if they were the you know, they were speaking to the child and they forgot that they were um, demanding and really intelligent and savvy. Um, and so we built a brand that was spoke to us and we created content that was very digestible and relatable and that enabled us to build the trust and the loyalty, which um, enabled us to capture information of understanding how we could better serve them and deliver solutions, um, which evolved into Rockets of Awesome because what they told us was that, you know, once they got beyond the stroller or the car seat dilemma of like, oh my God, my kid's not going to go to college if I buy the wrong one. Um, they then had the confidence to make those decisions, but the ongoing frustration that their kids were constantly outgrowing their clothes and it was very time consuming to find the good stuff that wasn't expensive was frustrating and we could deliver that solution for them. You both 
talk quite a bit about how the teams that you've built are really important. I think we talk a lot about community in terms of consumers, but can you talk a bit about community within the company and, and why that also is pivotal to creating a modern business? Yeah, you know, uh, authenticity is the key to any brand. It always has been, uh, but I think it's even more important today because in the age of the internet, uh, you can't hide, right? Every consumer can find out everything about your brand um, from uh, the products you sell, obviously, um, how it's manufactured, um, how you treat employees. Um, and if you're going to create an authentic brand externally, you need to live the values of those, that brand internally. So um, it's all about creating a, a, a corporate culture that's completely aligned with, with your brand. And what is culture? Culture is shared beliefs and shared rituals. So um, in a startup, especially both of our businesses and, and brands are relatively young, right, you need to jumpstart uh, a lot of those experiences and, and rituals. Um, and examples, when you join Warby Parker um, at your desk, um, there's a copy of Dharma Bums uh, right, by Kerouac. Um, it has, uh, we give you um, Martin's handmade pretzels um, which uh, are sold at the Union Square Farmer's Market because uh, at our first office, which was right on 16th Street in Union Square West, my mom would always come every Wednesday and give the team pretzels. Um, we have a balloon uh, that says, nice to meet you, and we spell it M-E-A-T, and there's a sort of steak with glasses um, uh, sort of waving to you. Um, and that's just an example of one of our core values, uh, inject fun and quirkiness in, into everything that uh, we do. Um, we uh, celebrate Halloween uh, religiously um, because that's core uh, uh, of what we do. And in fact, uh, we have the whole team dress up a few days before uh, Halloween. So they <laughs> have to travel to the office and take the subway like in, in full regalia, um, which makes for an interesting experience. Uh, when somebody starts, we have a full team meeting and they um, have to say uh, a fun fact about themselves. And again, that makes them vulnerable, but also can create connections uh, uh, among the team. So we have to wrap up. I know everybody's very hungry, but before we do, there's one question that I really want to ask you both. So you're married, you both have businesses, you've worked together. How, how do you work together day to day? What have you learned from each other? What is that dynamic like? Other than what we've seen today on stage. Yeah, so I think, thankfully, we don't actually work together, because I don't think that <laughs> yeah. would work so well. Um, but, you know, I've always felt super fortunate that we live very similar lives, but our own independent lives at the office, and um, completely understand what the other is going through, even if it's been at different stages or different times of our careers or our life. Um, we've been there, and we understand it. And so um, I think the greatest benefit is having... Um, you know, my best friend and my advisor who I live with, who I can ask questions to all the time, but more importantly that we never make each other feel guilty. You know, this world and, and our careers are very demanding and um, there's travel and, and late nights and lots of work and it's never, oh my God, why can't you be there for that? Or, um, you know, why do you have to make that decision? We just understand implicitly and the level of stress that that reduces out of our lives is so significant um, that, at least for me, it, it makes what I do and my ability to focus um, so much easier. Not every couple talks about fundraising and HR issues every now and then. You know, I, um, it was funny. I was, uh, last night I was uh, talking to uh, one of the founders of Whole Foods, and he was asking, oh, what are, what are we talking about to, uh, tomorrow? And I mentioned, um, you know, how we live and, and work. Um, and he said, you know, people always ask about work-life balance. Um, and his response is, I don't optimize for balance. I optimize for achievement. Um, and I'm going to steal a page from his book there. I think we're both optimizing for impact. Um, and, of course, that impact is across multiple dimensions, our professional lives, but obviously our, our family and our, our relationship um, as well. Um, and we just try and learn as much from each other as possible. Um, I mean, I was a nonprofit guy. Um, uh, Rachel basically put me through business school. She, her first business was a contemporary jewelry line that was sold in 400 doors. Um, it was the number one uh, line on, on shopbop.com uh, in its heyday. Um, and I just learned so much. And 
that got applied to Warby Parker, and, and we just try to exchange ideas and support, and most importantly, just uh, express gratitude to one another. So you lift each other up. Thank you both so much. Thanks. Thanks.